It's Waxing Miracle, baby. Hello, Waxers, and welcome to Waxing Miracle with Maines and Dots. I'm your host, Maines, and my colleague in the smoking jacket in Rainford. It's Mr. Neil Dutton. How are we, Neil? Sometimes you just want to, you know, sip port, smoke a pipe. Today it's was a spectacular clearly dressing one of those days. That meat is spectacular. It is quite nice. You can't really, you can't see my Batman slippers either, though, so that they don't really set it off. But or do they? Well, this is what people are saying. You know what I mean? Like, does Batman wear Batman slippers? That's the Probably question we've got to ask ourselves. Yeah. Unless it's like it's the ultimate, you know. No one will think I'm Batman if I'm wearing Batman slippers, you know. As he's, whenever he entertains people at Wayne Manor, God, we're off to a weird start. We are um, this week. Um, fancy over, so we're going to do a lot of previews and reviews. So um, we're going to give some quick week eighteen thoughts. It's you know multiple days since it's finished now, but we still think we should talk about it, and then. Thoughts on all the fire and usually Black Monday, but we've managed to get all the way to Black Thursday. We'll then look at the wild card, do a little bit of kind of picking games via the medium of spreads. Not really, not necessarily gambling, just using it as a as an idea while incorporating a big question for each of the games. Um, that sound good to you, Neil? It does. It does indeed. The phrase Black Thursday, of course, very apt. Yeah, right. Um, we we shall we shall plump on and let's plug into the mains. So Neil, um, week eighteen thoughts. I think there's there's two that you just can't avoid really. Um, first one first is uh, as an Eagles fan, <laughs> um, how much pleasure did you take in the in the Carson Wentz slash Indianapolis Colts choke job? I take no pleasure from it. The 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 first round draft pick had already been secured. So whether they went, you know, how how far they went in the postseason could only negatively affect how high that pick was. It was, it was not surprising that he wet the bed. Um, as you know, aside from a four-game stint in 2019 where Wentz literally put the team on his back and got a bunch of practice squad. Uh, practice squad skill position players to the playoffs and outside of that one magical season in 2017 Carson Wentz has been fairly ordinary in his NFL career it's now coming to light that you know judged by the Chris Ballard and Frank Reich's press conference that there's a better than even chance that he won't be the Colts quarterback next year so I'm, I'm not taking pleasure from it it's just that we said a few weeks ago, if the Colts wanted to get to where they wanted to go, which we assumed was the Super Bowl, that there would come games where Wentz needed to put it on his back, and he showed that he can't. So the, their defeat is utterly inexcusable on all levels, not just Wentz, from the top down. But the quarterback did not didn't even come close to performing. He didn't know. Um, what I will say is that I think there's a formula to um, win games for Carson Wentz, and that isn't allowing um, the Jaguars to complete their first nine passes, march down the field and score a touchdown, and start a seed of doubt, which I think the team didn't need. Now I'm not saying that that meant they were going to, you know, then capitulate, which they did. More a case of you know, that uh, that added to the disaster that occurred more than anything else. And I just look and think, three weeks ago or whatever, when we talked about the, the Colts and all that kind of jazz, we, we kind of said, as far as we were concerned, um, that they were the one team you wouldn't want to face in the AFC playoffs. And now they're not even in the AFC playoffs. So, you know, go us. Absolutely. But as we pointed out, you know, you have to make plays. Unfortunately, you can't just rely on your stud running back in the year of our Lord 2021. Sometimes the quarterback's got to make a play or not make the wrong play. And yeah, I think, that's a, been, I think that's a good way to put it, right? Yeah, been too many times this season where Wentz has made the wrong play at the wrong time. Now, granted, I say he, he's... 
he threw two interceptions, didn't he? So that only gave him seven and eight for the season. But there's so many plays where it's like, well, he's missed a wide open one there. Oh, look, he's been sacked and fumbled. You know, it's there was too many plays where it's like, Carson, we can't have that. And it shows that the problems that ran him out of Philadelphia are still there. If we move over to the other game with a bit of it, uh, where the Achilles heel came back to haunt the team, and that is the uh, Los Angeles Chargers and their rush defence. Um, or is it the Los Angeles Chargers and their overthinking coach? The Los Angeles Chargers have the personnel on so many spots in this team to be a playoff team. They have a playoff caliber quarterback. They have playoff caliber wide receivers and running back. They have a young, developing offensive line, and they have some good players in the defensive middle, you know, the defensive spine. They are one of the worst run defenses I've ever seen. Now, Brandon Staley comes from the Vic Fangio. No, no, we want you to run on us because we're happy to let you take try and go fifteen plays. We're going to stop you passing on us. That's a great philosophy, but if you can't stop the run with your front four, it's a terrible game plan. Now, people are saying about the timeout, you know, the, the crucial one. He took the timeout to get his best run fit on. That meant taking Kenneth Murray off the field. Kenneth Murray has not been good, despite what some people think. They think he's a name, therefore he must be their best run defender. He's not. He really is not. Read anything by um, Daniel Popper and The Athletic. Read anything by any but the Chargers beat writer. He has not been good. They took him off the field, put other people on, and still gave up 10 yards. <laughs> if they don't give up 10 yards, there's a better than even chance the Raiders say, do you know what, <clears throat> call it. We'll both do it. Mm, mm. But by getting that 10 yards, then they went, well, we don't actually have to do anything else now. We just need to trust Daniel Carlson, who's been fairly trustworthy all season. So, Especially in Las Vegas. Especially in Las Vegas, which is, you know, it's always a good pl- It's always a good thing to have something safe to bet on in Las right. Vegas. Oui. I just think that the Chargers have been let down because too many times they charged. They're another team. How how dare you think you have playoff pretensions and lose to the Texans the way they did the other week? Mm. And that's one of the games that you look back and say, if you'd won that, you're in. This this conversation's over. So it's the... People are going to criticise Staley because of the going for it and fourth down and whatnot. No, no, if that is his mentality, that's fine. Have a better play. Pick the best play. If you know, There's some plays where you can see... God, it's all wonderful how good Justin Herbert was on fourth down. It's your play call that's getting you to fourth down mm. when other teams try and avoid the third and fourth downs. He's wonderful, but unfortunately, after two seasons, it's the second coming of Dan Marino and not the second coming of Patrick Mahomes that we're seeing. Yeah, it's a shame. I think you know, as you said, there's a lot to a lot to be um, happy about in in Los, Los Angeles, but there's personnel issues on the way you play defense. I have. It's always my problem with certain coaches, and, and I think Brandon Staley's been a breath of fresh air for the for the league as a whole in terms of his open honesty, in terms of how he's spoke to the media. That's fine. Um, but you got a really shit rush defence, so stop playing that defence until you know you fix what you can do. Um, you say, oh, it worked in it worked in in um, in LA with the Rams. Um, Aaron, Aaron Donald, Donald yeah. the end. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes, it, it did work because you know it was Aaron Donald. So you know you need to be better, and they went and okay, they yeah. move on. But they've got to they've got to address that in the off season because if they do with the rest of the talent and the fact you've got someone like um, Justin Herbert, anything can happen at that point. But yeah. You know, if you score thirty-two points on the road, you should win the game. Yeah. The rest of it is noise, right? Do you know what there I mean? Is, yeah, there is not a mock draft I will take seriously or take part in this season that does not have the LA Chargers taking Jordan Davis in the first round. <laughs> seriously, just miss me if you're not going to put him to the Chargers. If someone else takes him before him, that's fine. But if he is still on the board. And you have the charge of taking anyone else. I'm not reading it anymore. Fantastic. Now let's move on quickly to Black Monday. 
Um, we're going to go team by team. Get your thoughts on uh, a. Was, do you, did you see the firing coming? And b. Um, why did it happen? What do you expect next? So let's start in the AFC North, and we'll start with Mike Zimmer and Rick Spielman uh, and the Minnesota Vikings. Saw so Zimmer going a mile off because he's just been getting more and more crotchety, more old man get off my lawn as the season's been going. The Vikings have made massive rods to their own back because they want to play close games. And we've seen it, you can't, it's not good for you because you, you, you encourage variance too much. Blow teams out. You've got one of the best wide receivers in the game in his second season. Blow teams out, especially when your defence isn't very good. So I can see him going. Uh, Spielman bit of a surprise but I think from you know he's been there forever there had been recent rumours that he was going to be moved upstairs maybe but I think he said no I still want to pick players and they said well no uh, so I think he's probably he's probably suffered more for his free agents signings than his draft mm. picks because I think they have drafted some good players yep. Justin Jefferson of course gifted to him by another franchise um, but he'll always be the court, the GM who broke the bank for Kirk Cousins. I this is this is my issue, right, on the kind of Rick Spielman concept or even the Mike Zimmer concept, right? Is you have a you get to the AF, NFC Championship game, you are favoured, you play. What we now know is a team of destiny. We didn't know that at the time, I don't think, Neil. Did we? No. Did we think that the Eagles were a team of destiny at that point? Not when Wentz got hurt, no, we didn't. No, I don't think we did, did we? So you lose that game and you think, okay, well, we could probably do with a better quarterback. Okay, that's that's a fair cop. And Kirk Cousins is better than Case Keenum. But he's not spectacularly better. And when you give him that kind of money, it then means that you lose out in other places, right? And those other places are probably the places where they eventually struggled and didn't cope with. Um, this is nowhere near a victory lap against Kirk Cousins. We, we said this four years ago, right? We can laugh at Washington all we want, and they haven't had a quarterback since. Fine. But they also knew that paying Kirk Cousins $40 million a year or $35 million a year wasn't going to work. Yeah, I agree. It's going to be interesting because, as as we know, Minnesota, um, their defence has been a great tragedy, and that's what's made me look stupid for two years in a row. And as you say, that is one area that they've had to neglect to pay Kirk Cousins. So I don't know, you know where they're going to go from here. I mean, Cousins, presumably, they're still locked into him. So you have to sell that to the next coach and GM. I would be phoning up the Pittsburgh Steelers immediately and saying, here you go, you pay his salary and you can have him. $21 million cap hit in 2022. Do you think Carson Wentz wants to come back to Pennsylvania? Oh. <clears throat> All, all such things. Um, Chicago Bears, Neil. Um, Matt Nagy's been fired since about week three. Um, however, I think there was a um, suggestion that Ryan Pace may stay because, you know, he hasn't been given enough chances to draft a franchise quarterback. So, uh, But he has also gone. So uh, big changes in Chicago. It uh, looks like they've gone down the 1985 route and decided that they're going to allow Bill, Bo- Bill Polian to help them. It's ridiculous that, I mean, it used to be that teams, you know, to really show they had their finger on the pulse of the modern NFL, they'd get Charlie Cassidy. Now it seems that honour has gone to Bill Polian. Well, he knows he knows the way the NFL is blowing now, which is why he wants his athletic mobile quarterbacks to take snaps at wide receiver, especially when they're black, isn't it, Bill? Uh, funny that. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's ironic, really, when you're looking at it, that over the last four seasons, Matt Nagy's teams have won more games than Carl Shanahan's. And Carl Shanahan uh, didn't have a Coach of the Year award in with her. But they, the double doink game broke them. Like the same way that that 38-7 to loss broke the Minnesota Vikings. The double doink broke the Bears and Nagy. So the Eagles are responsible for bringing down both of those NFC teams, NFC North teams, just a year apart. The Bears, 
defensively were good. They were not great. They were not the Bears of old because the players were getting old and they were, you know, a drop off in talent. Khalil Mack got hurt and whatnot. But the offense just didn't even look close to meeting them halfway. Alan Robinson had one of the worst contract years of all time. Justin Fields looked overwhelmed at times and untrusted at other times. Darnell Mooney looks like a nice player. David Montgomery looks like a nice player. I think are these the building blocks again that you want to say this is our offense we can build around them you're going to struggle so again it, it's a team that you look and think you've got a talented young quarterback this is screaming out for an offensive coach the Bears don't do that they don't want offensive coaches it's like the New York Jets you sense they only feel truly comfortable in their own skin when they have a defensive head coach so they did Nagy, he's offence, no, didn't work. They had Tressman, Vola, that didn't work. You know, Obviously not directly before, but a few years before, they haven't worked. They had John Fox, who they seem to accept and get by with. So I'd be stunned if uh, if a Dayball or a Keller Moore or a Doug Peterson ended up here. This is more likely to be a Brian Flores. And the GM search will be a crony, because that, that's what they've set themselves up to be. Your job as a franchise is to make Justin Fields good. Start, middle and end of conversation. However you believe that to be the case is fine. And we will get on to Miami. And I'm not comparing the two and there are different circumstances. But I'm not 100% sure if I saw what had happened in Miami with Tua that I want... That I want... Um, I want... Um, Brian... Far as anywhere near Justin Fields, it's it's ironic when Chicago had their last great run. The defensive coordinator was not answerable to the head coach. In no way can we say that. Yeah. So true. almost like the offense got by without the defense, and the offense did enough to high to showcase the real stars of that team. Well, we've got to flip the script now. That's 35 years ago. I don't think you can ha- now have a situation where a head coach is just going to give complete autonomy of the offense over to their offensive coordinator and let him deal with everything else. We've seen it the other way. We saw, you know, pretty much any. If you're the defensive coordinator for Sean McVay, you've got the Richie Pettibone mandate. Hmm. You know, get me the ball back. But I don't see it going the other way. I can't see someone like Flores coming in and just saying, whatever the offensive fellow wants to do is fine by me. Because we've seen him, you know, three seasons, four offensive coordinators. That's impressive. Um, let's move on to Miami. Uh, probably the shocker of the firings, and that's Brian Flores going after the 9 and 8 season where he won, at a period of time where he won seven straight games. I think this is a clash of personalities between him and Chris Greer. And I think it's ultimately come down to Chris Greer believes in Tua and has somehow made Stephen Ross believe in Tua, whereas Brian Flores probably didn't. So it's, yeah, as I say, two winning seasons on the row. That's great. You've swept the Patriots for the first time since Bill Belichick's first year in charge. Again, that's great. But it's three seasons and you haven't made the playoffs. It's, it's heady expectations for a team that's won one playoff game since Dan Marino retired, I think, maybe two. But if you're going to cause trouble, which in bio accounts Brian Flores might have done by being, you know, combative Bill um, and also Bill Belichickian. And as we thought, you know, we, we have said, uh, the, twi- the pair of us have said on occasion that he looked like the one Belichick assistant who might actually be working. It worked to a point because at least he got his side of the ball in order, for the most part. Defensively, they when they everyone was fit, they looked good. Mm. But he let the offence fester. And you can't have that. Stephen Ross isn't going to have that. Stephen Ross doesn't come in. He's not in Miami for, all, for six days a week. He comes in to watch the games. He wants to watch his team score points. We talked about this briefly, Neil, in kind of a, a question of... Do you remember the last coach who got fired because his offense, his offense was amazing and his defense was terrible? Never happens. But the issue with that Miami, their, their offense is seen as being one-dimensional and not very good. 
yeah, they can't run the ball. They operated a plinky plonky RPO based system that worked against the lesser teams. But as I say, they started out the season one and seven, and that was when they played good teams who you got quite beat frankly, by Jacksonville in London. Yeah, you know they 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 didn't buy it. most teams didn't buy that shit. So again, this is an ideal situation where again you've got the defensive pieces. Fine, you need an offensive coach to marry himself to Tua. Well, you've got a you've got a question to answer. Of is Tua the answer? Now, have they created a offense to limit him or limit him making mistakes and not being showing them up? Is to be seen. If someone would have told me at the start of the Brian Flores era that he would win four games out of six against Bill Belichick and still get fired, I would call you insane, but that's what's happened. Um, next person uh, is uh, Denver Broncos and Vic Fangio. And I guess the question is, this is the which, quarter, which offensive coordinator slash offensive man can we get in to convince Aaron Rodgers to come and play for Denver? The people who are saying that this job is made for Dan Quinn have just spec spectacularly misread the room in my opinion we've done defensive coaches here now as you say let's look at the pieces on offense this is screaming for an offensive guy to come in and take hold and hopefully do enough with the defense you know, to, to keep him competitive because the defense was very good on, on against the Chiefs Chiefs played a little bit pre-season in the first one there were a few business decisions being taken but in week 18 I don't blame them you bring in a defensive head coach with a track record of mediocrity as a head coach, based on the fact that they drafted an all-pro linebacker. You know, yeah, I am pointing fingers at you, Dan Quinn. It's incredible how these coaches look good with good players, isn't it? It's almost like players are important. You bring him into this situation, you've wasted everything. All these, all this offensive talent you brought in, you're wasting it. It's wasted now. You look last season, Jerry Judy, you know, we'll, we'll look at it through a fancy lens, shall we? Jerry yeah. Judy was unusable. Cortland Sutton was unusable. Tim Patrick had weeks where he touched wide receiver three, airspace, great. Noah Fant has all the physical tools to be a top tight end. It's unusable and unwatchable filth because of this offense. Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon, could you You could probably couldn't have a better one-two punch at running back. It all fell apart because of the quarterback. And we said this last year, so you want to bring in a defensive coach to do this all again? Well done. But even if you brought in a defensive coach, right, and then you got a really impressive offensive coordinator, and you got one good year out of them, that's a great story because they're going to be a coach, and then you still got Dan Quinn. Like, yeah. when are these teams going to learn? Right, I just don't understand it. It's crazy to me. Yeah, but you know, as I've, yeah, as I've said, nowadays it seems to be teams are happy to try and scheme up on defense and. If they have to churn that, they will. But you've got to have continuity with the quarterback. Head coach, quarterback, offense coordinator. The two of them should be in it for the long haul. And one of them should be, as long as I'm here, I'm helping. Let's move on to uh, the actual real clown show. And that's uh, the New York football giants. Um, Joe Judge out. The only real surprise was it took more than 10 minutes after the Washington game for that to occur. Um, when you call out Washington for I don't really know like no particular reason other than you know you were on a rant and you were playing for it um, and then get absolutely boat raced by them when like they probably want to win as much as you know as as no one because it doesn't benefit them in any way uh, you should be fired um, you have made your team worse um, you are a mouthpiece of the Bill Belichick school with zero stuff related to Bill Belichick it's just a disaster and it was it took too long for them to get rid of him in my opinion insane po po post-match press conferences are one thing because we were laughing at Nick Sirianni when he was talking about yes, planting seeds we were laughing at him and we were thinking this guy's one and done Nick Sirianni might be a little bit odd and as I say ultimately he may flame out we don't know at this stage, it doesn't. At this stage, it looks like he's off to a good start. Nick Sirianni doesn't tell lies in press conferences mm. that can be instantly shot down with anyone with reference to pro football reference, which everyone should have. By the way, it's a great website. When you come out and say just 
bollocks about oh we were all getting fired in New England. What? The last New England coaching staff under any pressure was in 1999 when Pete Carroll was running it. That was the last time New England coaching staff thought they were all getting fired. Correct, right? Because hey, guess what? They did. Last time I checked, Joe, you were not on that squ- that that uh, that uh, backroom staff. You're a liar. You're an idiot. You called two quarterback sneaks inside your own ten yard line in a real NFL game. At second and third down, people here were not talking like you know he's going for fourth and one. No, he's second and nine and third and nine, right? Yeah, second and nine, third and nine with Jake from you called the quarterback. See, you went out of your way to criticise the Eagles for tanking in Week 17, saying that they quit, we will never do that, and then did something worse. If I was a Giants fan, I'd be embarrassed. If I had had any affiliation to the Giants, I'd be ashamed because of what this idiot and his, you know, puppet master have done over the last, you know, get on over four years with this clown over two. They, this team won the Super Bowl ten years ago have been to the playoffs once since. There's a SB Nation video called The Collapse. They made mm-hmm. it in 2019. It's a great video because all the collapses on the SB Nation ones are, oh God, you need to add a new chapter because it looked like a joke then. It's worse now. It is worse now. This is one of the most storied franchises in the NFL. You cannot tell the story of the history of the NFL without the New York Giants. And right now, you can tell the story of the New York Giants because if you start from the bottom and work your way up, they're the first team you talk about. Finally, Neil, just before we started the show, um, David Cully fired us the Texans. Um, I think at the start of the season, if someone would have told you he was one and done, you'd be like, yeah, all right, yeah, I, I understand it because they've got the worst roster in the league and whatever. But I come now and I'm thinking, like, I don't really if I'm honest, understand it, because I'm not 100% sure. In in the list of things that are wrong with the Houston Texans franchise, I wouldn't put him in the top 10. Maybe I would, but he's definitely not in the top five. They knew that roster was dog shit because of how they built it. So they wanted a head coach who they thought would be seldom loved and easily missed if they fired him after one season. They didn't envision that coach getting his players to play for him. And they did. And see, so you look at some of the teams they've beaten. Look at some of the some of the games they were in. They should have beaten the Patriots. But that fear and unknown way to win cost them. Look at some of the other performances they put in. They've been a clown show. This is a team that's been described as classy because they released JJ Watt last year. Yeah, this te- this franchise just drips class. Surprised they've got surprised they've got any class left to do this remarkably classy move. Now, is David Cully the second coming of Vince Lombardi? No, he's not. That's why you wait till you're 65 to get a head coaching job at a team that no other bugger probably wanted. Yeah, exactly. But he's I... been in the NFL for a long time to wait for that chance, and he did the best he could with what he had and this classy franchise to make way for one of their cronies, because it's going to be someone who's who's been at the Patriots. Someone who Belichick even knows, you're not coming back here. Oh, God, no. Someone he knows he doesn't want any part of because of the, the, literally they opened their mouth and vomited all over the NFL. They'll get them in. But they didn't want that coach, that crony, to have a potential 4-13 and 13 season. So they let some other bugger do it. Disgusting. Yeah, and the, the issue for the Houston Texans is... They've still got the same issues they had at the start of last season. Um, they have a franchise quarterback. They can't play. They can't trade. They have. They don't think they still don't have any draft picks this year, do they? Is that is it? They still got no first round draft pick this year. No, I think, I think they've got a first round this they year. They got first round this year. That's back, but there's still a lot of holes on the on the on the on the roster, and I just look and think, I'm not sure. Um, it's one of them things we'll see um, but I can't see this change of coach making much difference to how they how the team goes anyway that's it for Black Monday and Thursday and Tuesday 
So let's get on with the wildcard preview, Neil. And let's quickly zoom through the games. First game, Neil, is it Raiders at Bengals, Saturday, half past nine UK time. Um, Palmer and Johnson couldn't do it. Dalton and Green couldn't do it. Can Burrow and Chase do it? And that do it is win a playoff game. The last time the Cincinnati Bengals won a playoff game, no one could text their mate to say we won. Do you know why? Because text messaging hadn't been invented yet. And wouldn't be invented for another decade after it. <laughs> Um, yes, I think they can. Uh, this offense is purring. They have a quarterback playing at an extremely high level. They have two exceptional young receivers, a steady, t- a steady, you know, steady tight end slot receiver, good running game, playmakers on defense, and they're playing a Raiders team who, you know, incredible that they got here, but also went into overtime and didn't finish playing till 4 a.m. on Monday morning, and are now playing a game five days later. I look and think, I hear all that, and then I just see the Cincinnati Bengals and like Charlie Brown going to kick a football, and I'm like, uh, yeah, what bad thing can happen to this team? Um, I hope nothing. Um, I think congratulations to the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, I think if we would have talked about it in week three or whatever when John Gruden was fired that this team would be in the playoffs um, I would have laughed you out of the out of the building right this team's done a fantastic job to get where they are bravo to Derek Carr to finally get in the playoffs um, but I have to, I'll be honest um, it's west of us for me and I hope that the case is, is broken in and up wherever Chris is he enjoys the game and of course I say it's the Bengals so they're playing in the first game it's as you say it's West of Us and it's the first West of Us without them so exactly um, Neil Bengals are minus five and a half um, who are you picking uh, I'm going to take the Bengals and I'll take I'll take them to cover I think that this might be one where they just move away from the Raiders as the game progresses. It's going to be a shame because, as I say, I own three active players in the NFL, uh, their jersey. Only one of them is in the playoffs, and that is Derek Carr. So I will be wearing his jersey. As I say, I'm sure he, this, this will comfort him. But I think I'll only get to wear it once. Um, I'm going to take the Raiders to cover, but the Bengals to win. I think it's going to be close. It's going to be painful. It should be a good watch. Um, Over-under is 49, Neil. Uh, do you think it's high scoring or not? Uh, no, I don't think it's going to be that high scoring. I think it'll be quite cagey. I can see, you know, uh, say 24-14, something like that. I'm going to take the the under as well. I think it's a tight game. I think it's maybe a bit sloppy. Um, but as I said, I expect the Bengals to get over the line. But if you're, if you're expecting a, a, a cosy one, nice and relaxing for Bengals fans, uh, I've got news for you. I don't see it. Um, Next game, Neil, Pat at Bills, Sunday, 1 o'clock in the morning, so Saturday night into Sunday morning. Question that I have is, will the weather hamper the Bills again? Now, to be fair, it is going to be super, super cold. However, there's no snow, and right now, limited wind, but that wind, that chill will be extreme. Um, what are your thoughts on, on the Bills v. the Pats, Neil? I don't think this is going to shoot out. From if the last two meetings between these are anything to go by, it's hard to beat uh, the same team twice in a season. It's even harder when you've played them for the third time in six weeks. I would imagine the Patriots have not looked at their best since that Bills game, the first one. Whereas the Bills, I'm not going to say they backdoored their way into the playoffs because they didn't, but they didn't look great. They decided to lean on the ground game to show. As I, I said, you know, when I picked Devin Singleton as a fancy darling, I said they're going to do this out of sheer bloody mindedness, establish the run. Well, they have Devin Singletary and Josh Allen as a duo have been quite successful for them. I just think the Bills have got more playmakers on offense than the Patriots. Plus, I say the Patriots just seem to be in a little funk at the wrong time for them but ultimately if you'd said to them at the start of the season playoff game with Mac Jones you're going to be fine with that Belichick would say no he wants to win the Super Bowl but I think in the back of his mind he'd think 
that shows progress from where they are. So I just think the Bills are going to have too much for them. It's a, it's a successful season for the New England Patriots right now. Whatever happens, now that's difficult for people to realise because they used to win the Super Bowls, right? And that's fine. But where we expected them to be, or where most people expected them to be, I think a playoff place is good. Um, Stefan Diggs was quoted as saying that um, Josh Allen needs to take some um, some some spice off his throws in the cold because it because it hurts. Um, Josh, that would be nice. Um, there's a um, Mina Kimes is coming up with a uh, like what's your wildest take that you should that you that anyone's got in relation to sports and hers is that the, the Bills should build a dome um, because they'd win more games. Um, I'm all for it. No problem with me. Uh, <laughs> the Bills need to make it a Bills game, right? Do you know what I mean? And and the issue with that is a Bills game. They probably prefer it to be at least ten or fifteen degrees warmer. Um, I can see a way in which they lose, and that's not good. You shouldn't when you're playing a division against the. You shouldn't really see a way to lose. Like they don't, they did dominate the Pats in in Foxborough. Um, it was close because it was supposed to be close in 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 Orchard Park the first time. Um, if I wake up and someone tells me that the Patriots killed kicked a last second field goal, I'll be like, yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, Neil, um, Bills are minus four. What are you taking? I'm taking the Bills. Um... I'll take them to cover. I'm going to do the same as before and take the Pats um, to cover again. Um, I think it's a really close game. I think this is a this is a field goal at the end of the game type game. Um, so I, I'm going to take I'm going to take the Pats to cover the four. Um, Bills could still win, but I, I think it's really close. Uh, Over under is forty four. Neil. Ooh. Oh, I'm going to take the over. Over neat, nice. Uh, I, I, in theory, what in a in a weird sense, uh, one of the shop was saying sixty percent of uh, games in these weather conditions are over. So I am also going to take the over, but I do think it's a really really tight game. Let's move over to Sunday evening, and that's um, Neil's game, um, and that is Eagles at Bucks Sunday six pm UK time. Um, there's only one question for me. Will the Bucks be able to stop the run heaviest team in the NFL? No team in the NFL threw less than the Philadelphia Eagles. Can will the Philadelphia Eagles continue to do that? I expect them to. Will they be get success on it? Neil, that's the question for you. Well, it was half time in the game against the Bucks in week six where the Eagles first realised, you know what, we need to run this more. And then the, the ironic cheers when Miles Sanders opened the second half with a run. And it was like, this shit could work. And then from then on, literally, that is what they've done. The, the Eagles need to be true to what they are on offense. And that is a running team. Now, it's hard to run on the on the books, I know. But it was hard to run on the Saints. And the Eagles ran all over them. The Eagles have been pretty much, we don't care about the matchup. We're going to run. The important thing is, you're going to run okay, that's fine. Jalen Hurts needs to be able to make a few plays when it gets to third and six. Third and two, that's fine. That's manageable. You'd hope that the play call and whatnot can last for that. But if they get to third, six and longer, Jalen Hurts is going to have to play flawlessly because the fellow on the other side is going to be flawless because I don't know if anyone told him the last time he played the Eagles in a playoff game, he eviscerated them and lost. And I know that Tom tends to forget these things. The big pisser for the Eagles is that Levante David looks like he's going to play. The difference between their defence when he's on the field and when he isn't is quite marked. The Bucks give up um, minus, minus, point, minus 0 0.11 EPA per play, uh, per rushing play when he's on the field. Uh, that's minus 0 0.03 when he's on. So I think I hope I've got that right. I hope I've got them the, wrong, the right way around. Basically, when he's on the field, they're, they're considerably much better at stopping the run when he is on the field. Of that, exactly. there is no doubt. Yeah, I've got it completely right. It's 0 
per play when he's on the field, zero point minus zero point zero three without him. The higher number is obviously better. Um, interesting note that I found is I say the Eagles have ran the most inside and outside zone of any team in the NFL this season. There's two hundred and thirty seven carries, which is third. Third total carries, 986 yards, which is third most yards, and 12 rushing touchdowns on inside and outside zone plays. And that's the first. The Buccaneers have faced the 29th most inside and outside zone and have given up the 29th most inside and outside uh, yards on that. So again, just because teams haven't done it to what the Eagles do, they need to do it. Another interesting fact, and you know, the Eagles don't blitz and probably won't blitz. Tom Brady was blitzed on 24.1% of his dropbacks this year. This is courtesy of Pro Football Focus. He averaged 8 point yards per attempt and had a 14.5 touchdown to interception ratio on his on his uh, throws when he was being blitzed. Interestingly though, he had 11 passes dropped an 8.5% drop rate. Those 11 passes dropped when he was blitzed was the second most in the NFL. And this is something that Mark Schofield has said over the years. You can't confuse Tom Brady, but he confuses receivers. So if it's just Mike Evans and Gronk, obviously they're going to get theirs. But there's Scotty Miller, you know, Tyron Johnson, um, you know, Sil Grayson, these other people, you know, Tyler Garden, these people like that. If you can confuse them and get them to run the wrong route then you can put pressure on Brady because he knows he has to be perfect. Because we've seen that if he's blitzed, maybe he just gets his throw off a little bit quicker. It's still effective most of the time, but his receivers can drop the ball. But as the page, as the Eagles blitzed at the 31st highest rate in the league last season, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Do you know who's had the, be- the best PFF rating in... Since Chris Godwin got injured, wrong. Tom Brady. So Tom Brady has been the best quarterback in the league since his best wide receiver left. What the actual fuck is that man? That man is not human. And the sooner we figure out what it is, um, the better. Um, I, I look and think if you if you if you want to laugh in in a kind of hilarious way of. We always talk about how do you win leagues or win in in soccer, or um, how it, how do you uh, win things? And people always say, "Well, you just got to beat the teams around you." Do you know what? You don't. No. You beat shit teams. You need to beat shit teams very very well. The Eagles won how many games this year, Neil? Nine. How many shit teams did they play, Neil? All of them. Yep, yeah, nine. They that's what you do. You beat bad teams, and then you eventually get good at beating better teams. Do I think Jalen Hurts is the answer? No, I don't. Uh, and I'm, I'm fine enough to be wrong on that in, in, in future years. Um, but did I also expect the Philadelphia Eagles to make the playoffs? Absolutely not. I thought they were just as bad as the New York Giants. That is obviously not true. Um, bravo to Nick Sirianni, who, as you said, may be weird. I think that's fair, but that doesn't mean he's not a good coach. And also, what I like about it is in the opposite of Brandon Staley kind of idea is I think Nick Sirianni has a way of playing and I don't think it's running it 40 times. However, his way is winning. So he decided the only way to win was to run it 40 times. Do I think that will work against the Tom Brady and the Buccaneers? No, I don't. I don't. Um, I think there's a possibility this could be the most lopsided game in the, in the wild card. And that's nothing against the Philadelphia Eagles whatsoever. Um, Neil, books are minus eight and a half. I'm taking the books. I everything the Eagles had to be perfect. And this team has an excellent receiving tight end. It has an offensive identity that has worked against everyone else. It's got a functional dual threat quarterback. It's got one really good wide receiver. If Tom Brady's on fire, it can't match it. And defensively, I just think the Bucks have got a little bit too much for the Eagles. So I don't think it's going to be a chastening loss, but I can definitely see it being 10 points. Yeah, I'm with you. 10 to 14 points. I'm also going to take the Bucks. Um, Neil, over-under is 46. I'll take the over. 
Yeah, and I will also take the over on that. I think there will be points scored. I expect the books to get somewhere around 30. Um, and again, that's nothing against the Eagles. I think, you know, this isn't, they deserve to be in the playoffs. Absolutely. I just think this is a step too far. Yeah, it's, it's as you said. I mean, is Jalen Hurts the answer? Probably not. But is he so much the problem that he must be replaced? No. So if in doubt, if there's nothing better, then you go again with him next year while he's still cheap, and you see you see where you go. So I mean, if if somehow the Eagles pull this off, then he's the starter for you know the next two years probably because that's what the Eagles do. You know, you win super you win Super Bowls or playoff games, the the team tends to like you, but. It's, I'm, I, yeah, I'm nothing if not realistic about this team, and like to think I have been yes, since agreed. 2017. So, um, next game, Neil, half nine Sunday. And um, we talked about West of us, um, and, and the and the football and gods have shined upon um, what I would define as a classic John Madden game here. Cowboys at 49ers. I assume the quarterbacks are Troy Aikman and Steve Young. Looking forward to it. Pat and John on the call. Um, Channel Four, when a when a ball hits and there's there's, there's a, a, a Channel Four sign with a helmet on, that's what I'm expecting to see here. Nostalgia galore, but the question on the game, Neil, is is the major strength of the Cowboys defense completely and utterly nullified because they're playing the 49ers who won't play that way? Uh, yeah, I think that's the, that's a good point. Say, so we know that the 49ers their their model is removing the quarterback from the game plan their own I mean not the, the opposition's they want to get the ball out of his hands into you know their playmakers and let them make plays the Cowboys have not played anyone with a weapon like Debo Samuel they just haven't um, so they, you know they, what do you want what, what do you want to do you want to put a co- you want to put a wide a cornerback on him best of luck you want to put Micah Parsons on him best of luck they're going to give him the ball 10 15 times you know on the air and in the ground uh, you know in the air and on the ground and then hope Garoppolo can make enough plays around that that you know they can benefit from how much attention he's going to have the cowboys beat the living snot out of the eagles third string on saturday and apparently that was a, that was seen as a statement of what the fact we should have more preseason games what what you know, the, uh, while it was while the Eagles were competitive, it was a very close game. Which, if I'm the Cowboys, I'm not exactly singing, you know, you know, sea shanties about at this stage of the season. The Cowboys have not looked good for most of the last six weeks. Uh, the last time they really hummed was against Washington, but that surrounding that, so against Washington and against the Eagles, Resies, they look great. Against everyone else they've played, they've looked lackluster on offense and a bit toothless on defence so I'd worry that when we're in the playoffs and your key decision makers when it comes down to the crunch when it comes down to the margins you know the 1% you're relying on Mike McCarthy and Dan Quinn I don't know how confident I am with that I look at this and I think if someone said to me pick one road wildcard team to win the game out of all six this would comfortably be the game I chose and that's that's just because this is an horrific matchup for the Dallas Cowboys like I know they lost to the Cardinals a couple of weeks ago but they clearly would have wanted to play the Cardinals more than the 49ers like for how much we got the Colts wrong in the AFC team to avoid we said you didn't want to play the 49ers and I really don't think you do. Um, and I believe Trent Williams is back. And if Trent Williams is back, he's the best left tackle in the league still. Well, one of. Um, and adding him to your running attack could be serious for the Cowboys. Um, I, uh, well, I'll just say it. like The Cowboys are minus three, and I'm absolutely picking the San Francisco 49ers. To win the game outright, never mind cover. I think I agree. This it, this looks like a classic Dallas letdown spot because I just as good as they've been on defense, their defense makes plays. The Shanahan offense is designed in a sense to try and put you in a position where you can't make plays because it's so in structure. His structure will get you out of position. 
So yeah, you you pick off a lot of passes. I'm not throwing your way. Yeah, you, you know the linebacker can do this in the passing game. I'm not looking your way. I just think Shanahan is he's an arrogant prick. We know this, but I think we also know he'd like to put one over Dan Quinn. Yeah, yeah, I, I, he is a, he is an arrogant prick. Uh, he also holds a fucking massive grudge. Um, so uh, as you said, I fully expect him to he, put it this way. I don't think he'd be kneeling to save them from scoring again. Um, over under is fifty and a half, Neil. I'm going to take the under because we've seen that Shanahan doesn't want to run up the score. He wants to literally take the last second off the play. Doesn't want to run a lot of plays. So I think it's going to be under because I think they will score as many points as they need to and Dallas won't be able to catch up or match. I'm going to take the under 2-0. Uh, you know, talking like we're close, like a 28-21, something like that. Really, really close to the over-under. Um, if they lose... Um, like, does Jerry pull a trigger? No. Which is amazing. That's great news. That's all I wanted to hear. I just wanted confirmation. Um, Monday, Monday, mo- Sunday night in the mon- well Monday morning, Quarterbacks one is <laughs> Steelers at Chiefs. Just what everyone wanted. Um, There's a simple question there, really. That can the Chiefs avoid a slop ve- a slop fest close game? I say, if this becomes a shootout, you know, a trench battle, it increases the chance that the Steelers steal it. So let's pray to God they can't, because I've no desire to watch this god awful offense any longer, especially not when I haven't got red zone and six other games for Scott to take me away to, when it's the only game to watch. Seriously, oh, Jesus that throw Christ. to McLeod, Ray Ray McLeod, in, in the Baltimore game. Proves that any of us could be an NFL quarterback. It like it like when instead of a tight spiral, it seemed to go end over end like he punted it. Yeah. We have seen uh, Roethlisberger punt in the past, little pooch kicks. So maybe you should try that. If the Chiefs can find their rhythm, if the Chiefs are fully healthy, this disintegrating Steelers defense can't cope with them because we saw a few weeks ago that it couldn't. If this has any adverse weather or anything, or something goes wrong early for the Chiefs, God help us. Because as much as we don't want certain people to have the walk-off into the sunset moment that people like Peyton Manning had, and John Elway, if they, if they're, if they're, if the Steelers are any stage, like 10 points up in this game, I'm sorry, the football gods have turned on us, and we better get used to it. Um, weather for Sunday is... Um... Highs of one, and lows of minus three. Um, Christ, it's happening. With a with a only a ten percent chance of rain and an eight, only eight mile an hour wind, so it's just cold, Neil. It's just cold. Um, Rothelberg thir- thirteen of fifty eight attempts for one hundred and twelve yards, two touchdowns, eight interceptions, and they win fourteen <laughs> three. <laughs> um, fuck. There's two ways this game goes. You mentioned Dan Marino before. Um, Dan Marino's last ever game was in Miami against the Jacksonville Jaguars, and he lost 62-7. I remember watching it, because I'm fucking old. It happens like that. Or, as you said, all them stats. You know, what happens if we don't wish injuries on anyone? But what happens if we get a TJ Watt, Patrick Mahomes... Incident early first quarter, and it's Chad Henney against Ben Roethlisberger. The millions of television sets across the globe go dark. The Chiefs are minus thirteen. Nearly taken. Um, I'm going to take the Chiefs, but I'm going to take the the, the Steelers to cover. Okay. Yeah, I'm also I'm also gonna... doing the same. Thirteen in a playoff game is fucking loud points, right? Yeah, I that don't think Big Red's, gonna, uh, you know, Big Red's not going to unleash the full fury in the first round of the playoffs when all they have to do is basically wait for the Titans to slip up in the second round to get a home field uh, AFC title game. 
Yeah. Um, Neil, over or under is 46 and a half. Um, I think I like the under here. Yeah, agreed. Under. I mean, if we if we're picking the Steelers to cover, that means the Chiefs haven't scored more than thirteen. So if we assume, sorry, I haven't beaten them by more than thirteen. If we assume that the Steelers get their maximum points of thirteen, um, we should be safe. Um, because then you're looking at some kind of probably twenty three thirteen type score, which is far too close for comfort and a game that no one should really watch. No. Um, final game is Monday Night Football, Neil. Um, first, um, and it's Cardinals at the Rams again. Monday night into Tuesday morning, quarter past one Tuesday morning. Question for me on this is: Is this game a referendum on Sean McVay and Matthew Stafford as a couple? Are these two teams the two biggest bluffs in the NFL? The Los Angeles Rams are twelve and four, and probably and. and- did they look like a twelve and five, you know, twelve and five outfit in the last few weeks of the season? As they were, you know, they looked at it in the first half against the San Francisco 49ers and then I don't know, something happened. Like yeah. I, I got tired, and then the next minute it was like they're getting beat. I'm like, what's going on? Um, Cardinals the Cardinals again. are the greatest September and October team in NFL history, and have been for the past three years. Yeah, these two, these two teams are mirages, the bluffs. Um, I don't think it's going to referendum on Sean McVay or Matthew Stafford because you cannot tell me. Yes, I know EPA and whatnot. Apparently, it's frighteningly similar between Stafford and Goff when Goff was his peak. Grow up. Let, let's 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 be let's be real here. The Rams have not been this high-powered offensive juggernaut that we thought, especially when they traded for Beckham, because they had to change themselves on the fly. You know, with uh, they lost Bobby Woods. And things like that. They've, they've, they've looked like they, they're, they're vacillating when it comes to what they want to do on the ground game. Still great defense. They've still got Aaron Donald, who has had a quiet season. Oh, if all my seasons were so quiet as Aaron's, I just think as well the Cardinals that when your passing game in the playoffs comes down to Zach Ertz in 2021 and Antoine Wesley. I think you're operating on smoke and mirrors because I cannot see that system beating the Rams. Do I think the Rams blow them out? No. I think the Rams will make enough mistakes on offense themselves to keep this game very close. But ultimately, both of these teams at various points of the season looked like juggernauts and then fell away and got to the playoffs and hats off to them. But the second half of the season, it lacked a signature performance per se. I mean, you cannot the, the Rams winning in Baltimore, really? That's what we're going to say. The off, the, their offense looked so good that day, did it? Yeah. And the Cardinals won in Cowboy in, at the Cowboys again. Was that more the Cardinals or the Cowboys? I don't know. So, I think it, it's apt that this team, this game, is the last one because, as I say, it's it's between two teams who've done various disappearing acts at times this season. What I find interesting about the game, and I guess if we look at it from the Rams' point of view first, is there's always this talk about, oh, well, when this quarterback gets to a better team, he'll be better. Have we ever thought that quarterbacks are just quarterbacks? And, okay, personnel helps in certain situations... But in other situations, like, they're just the quarterback. Like, Matthew Stafford is playing like Matthew Stafford plays. And I think we thought that he threw dumb interceptions because he played for the Lions. I think he threw dumb interceptions because he's Matthew Stafford. Like, and I think one of the, like, elephants in the room on the Detroit Lions thing is, isn't it? it's not like he didn't have weapons to throw to in his no, time that's... in Detroit. Do you know what I mean? It's like you you, you talk, oh, he's he's going to a much better team now. Team, yes, comfortable in that kind of assumption. But don't be telling me he was throwing to, like, the the wide receivers that Tom Brady was throwing to in New England or the ones he's throwing to in, 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 in Tampa now or some of the other teams and some of the terrible skill position players they've had because that's just not true and it never has been. 
Yeah, the idea that the Lions had no one to catch the ball is one of the greatest footballing myths of the 21st century. Up there with the Patriots have got no stars on defence in the first few years they won the Super Bowls. It's bunk. It's absolute <laughs> bollocks. And, you know, don't piss in my pocket and tell me it's raining with that crap. Um, yeah, it's, it's as you say, it's, is he an upgrade? Yeah, but he's also Matt Stafford. Was coming to a system, you know, a situation with a better offensive play caller, with better weapons and a better offensive line. Was that supposed to see him elevate his own game? Yeah, it was. Did it at times, but you know, you can take the you, you take the boy out of Detroit, but can you really ultimately take the Detroit out of the boy? Exactly, and also I think if we go on the Cardinals, I think no one expected them to win this many games. I didn't. Um, I love watching Callum Murray play football. It's a bit weird because. You know, let's be honest, he's tiny, um, and that makes it look weird. But he's a great, great quarterback. He hasn't got spectacular weapons to throw to. Um, I'm far from convinced by Cliff Kingsbury as a head coach. Um, I think this is as far as they can go. Um, so it Rams are minus four, and I'm going to take the Rams. The best player on the park at any stage of this season because he seems to be completely game-proof dependent, is Cooper Cup, And mm. ultimately, I would back him to make more plays when needed than anyone on the Cardinals' offence. And, you know, I, I love I love and respect Zach Ertz as much as anyone. Of course. But, seriously, this stage of the game? No, I, I, I will take the Rams. I don't think it's going to be a blowout. I think it's going to be an uninspiring event, though, because these two teams should be lighting the sky on fire. And I don't think they will. Forty nine and a half is the over under Neil. Um, I will. I, I think we'll just go over, but it won't be a what? Well, what a game that was! It'll be a god. There were that many points. Hmm. Um, that's it. Six games. Um, which is cool. And then back next week for another batch of divisional games, which is, I think, consensus the best weekend of football in in the NFL. So, should be some good games this week. But I do think there's a couple of stink- stinkers. Um, I'm not interested in Steelers Chiefs. Um, I'm morbidly interested in Bengals, um, Bengals Raiders. Um, but yeah, um, I think the game that I'll be I'll be making sure appointment viewing is um, 49 as a Cowboys. Absolutely, Neil. Uh, long show, um, long night. Where can people catch you? Till we're back next week. Find me on Twitter at end up thirteen. Um, pretty much. I've only got the Super Bowl odds tracker for number five for the next few weeks. We'll be rolling out soon my, um, well, mine, the rookie comparison series for Rotoviz. This is where I look at some of the high performing fantasy rookies, uh, say, look back at their season and look at some comps. Uh, from recent years in terms of you know people of comparable production coming from the same position. So if I tell you that Trevor Lawrence, statistically, his closest comps over the last 11 seasons are Blake Bortles, Sam Bradford, Deshaun Kaiser, Carson Wentz, and Andrew Luck. Mostly looking forward, you'd think this guy's going to have to do an awful lot to become something in the NFL. Just quickly before we go, um, did you see Andrew Luck in the national title game? I did not. He needs to go and find it. He's lost somewhere in the region of half his body weight, and he's got an excellent mustache. Um, if you haven't seen it, just find him. Um, he, he is so he has gone dad life. Um, that is a man a, who's doing Pilates rather than eating steaks. Yeah, he was always a champion of facial and neck hair, though, wasn't he? He was, but Neil, you need to see the weight on him. Yeah, or lack on him. Um, I, we are at waxing underscore lyrical. I am at Mindy Seven. Neil is at End Up Thirteen. If you like my voice, also check out the touchdown review from the touchdown.co.uk. That was out on Tuesday. Thomas Willoughby, Callum Squires, Taiba Boo and Joe Valenzuela all chatting to me about numerous parts of Week 18 and they will be doing it again this week on the playoffs. Me and Neil will be back next week talking divisional round. Until then, these top guys are out.